So I'm with uh, Bill Schwartz, who's in Bahrain, uh, responsible not just for Bahrain, but uh, countries around Saudi, including Iraq. Uh, Bill, what is the impact of COVID-19 where you are? Of course, the, the, the most obvious impact is the shutdown. People are being um, struggling with the concept of isolation. Um, but I think it's radically different here because half of the population are, are migrant workers. And um, the sense of community is very, very different. Thinking in, particularly in terms of life of the church, the, the church kind of substitutes for the uh, extended family network that you would have in your home country. I think from the pastoral point of view, um, as, as in other places, many people have lost their jobs as the, all the whole service industry is shut down. Uh, I think in general in society here, people have not been treated badly, but the economics are as they are. Uh, and I think it's, for instance, we as a church have put on a big program to collect food and we make up, you know, parcels for, and people come to the church looking for food. Uh, there are other agencies. They do have someone they can turn to, not so much they can come to me and I'm the solver of all problems, but as, as a community, uh, here in Bahrain, we are, are allowed to gather in groups of not more than five. So it is possible for people actually to come to the church and pray, uh, as long as they don't sit next to each other. Uh, and we can have a wedding. Uh, it's a very small wedding, but you know the, the, the normal functions of church, uh, in the beginning, it was all feeling like it's all gone. Uh, we're, we're kind of clawing back at some levels of normality, and, and that's become very, very reassuring to people. Is there a sort of connection? Because obviously Christians in the Middle East, and particularly Iraq, for example, you know, have been under incredible pressure. Um, and is there a sense, and I've heard it in one or two other places, where there's a coming together, you use the term community, across faiths, or is it actually deepening the gulf between different faiths? It's a great question because the meeting I finished a half hour ago was an interfaith gathering by Zoom covering all of the religions here in Bahrain, really just so that we could each take a turn and say a prayer. Um, it was a lovely little opportunity uh, and, and I think very reassuring for all of us that the, there is a commonality that we share in spite of whatever our particularities might be. So that sounds quite encouraging, Bill, because you spent many, many years in your ministry uh, in that part of the world uh, working across faiths. Um, what about at the, the, if I can call it, the level of the pew rather than the level of the pulpit? I have to say, I don't see that here. Um, Bahrain is an extremely diverse and very accepting country. Um, I, and of, of all the different countries I've lived in the Middle East, this is the one that I have felt most relaxed and accepting of other people's identities, traditions, and, and religious background, uh, which makes much, much, much easier for, uh, for all of us to have a sense of common purpose and to, to try to work together um, to meet the issues, the practical issues in society. And what about beyond Bahrain? Um, because you, I know you can't get there, but you have responsibility for those other countries. Would you say it's the same story or are there different, um, uh, different grades? Oh, I mean, it just starts with which country I choose. You mentioned Iraq. Um, the thing about the Iraqi people that I find just amazing is how resilient they are. They've had 30 years of chaos. Uh, and the coronavirus is just one more on top of and amongst others. Um, but they haven't lost a sense of purpose. They, they, they're struggling, certainly. And uh, I mean, Yemen is part of my uh, oversight as well. And we have the medical clinic in Yemen, which has continued through the whole civil war thing. And uh, the staff, there are all Yemeni Muslims, but they, they work in the church compound to serve other Yemeni Muslims, particularly the poor. Uh, and again, resilience, I, it's just, it's so humbling 
when you, we, we moan because we can't go to the mall, they get electricity four hours out of a day, water two days out of a week. Uh, and and it, it's to me very frightening because the virus is just gonna run through the whole country. Uh, and when, when there's a death nowadays, they really don't know whether it's the coronavirus or cholera or dengue fever or a number of other things which are endemic throughout the whole country. But the people carry on, it's just amazing. So there's really something for us in the affluent West, if I can put it like that, although there's a, certainly plenty of poverty in the West, but there's something about the resilience uh, of the peoples of the Middle East and uh, that, that we can learn from. I think so, um, particularly in countries like Iraq and Yemen, where poverty is the norm rather than the exception. Um, and of course, the disruption of public infrastructure and things like that. Um, creates another whole level. But if you look at the more, what are normally considered affluent countries, um, one of the things that we work with all the time is the stratification of the society. Um, not only economically, but those, those are also determined somewhat by nationality backgrounds uh, and racial issues. Um, those, in, in those situations, the gaps are not covered very well. They continue to exist. Um, and I think, it, it, in my experience, the church is one of the very few institutions that can really cover that whole stratification because when you go to church, it doesn't matter whether you're an ambassador or a maid. Um, and it doesn't matter about your nationality in principle unless you're in a particularly ethnic oriented church because of the language expression or something. But I think the, the sense of we're all in this together is becoming a bigger and bigger dimension of how people see themselves, particularly those who are temporarily in, in this part of the world and hope someday to return to their home country. And if there is this sense of coming together, is that something you think can continue afterwards? And of course, we don't know what afterwards is. Um, we do know that it's going to be many months, if not years away. Um, or is it, are we better off thinking, okay, let's focus on the here and now and the next 18 months, say, uh, than uh, returning to some sort of uh, panacea of normality? I'm not reflecting other people's perspectives other than my own, when I say, um, I find that people are worried about today and they're dreaming about when it's all over. Um, I don't find many people actually digging in and gearing their, their speed, so to speak, to, to how we're going to continue within the context because it isn't going to go away for a long time. Um, and I think that people are almost afraid to be thinking that way. Of course, there, we have to also promote hope. Um, but the, as you said, the realization that we don't know what it's gonna be like. Um, I've already made plans that the day that they allow us to open the church, we won't be able to get everybody in because they'll have to be socially distanced. So I've got to prepare to do twice or three times as many church services in order to be able to get people in. Um, and it's those kinds of future thinking that we've got to be doing. And I suppose as we draw to a close, um, there is this um, theme, if you like, of the church will be there after we've gone, right? Uh, and yes. what might that look like, do you think? I, I can't answer that in the short term. Um, because we are very, very much under whatever the local Islamic government determines. Um, and and that, that's true differently in all the different countries around here, um, because churches are considered uh, guest institutions rather than indigenous institutions. Um, and there will be a lot of control exercised over how we meet, which, okay, we have to work with it. Whatever it's going to be, we'll work with it. But I also kind of always, always take the opportunity to remind church councils, clergy, whatever, that what we do today will be remembered 50 years from now. And what we do today will affect how the church exists 
50 years from now. And so we should always keep that in mind. Uh, and, and uh, you know, speaking as a Christian in a church context, but I think th th this is something, the message that we now get put out to all of society is, this is not just about us. It's about those who, whom we're handing over to for the future. And we need to respect both and, and work them both at the same time. Phil Schwartz, thank you very much.